Hello again and welcome to another Warhammer 40k Moria Glory video. In today's episode, we shall be asking and answering one important question, which is the best Lehman Rust battle tank in 10th edition. Seven variants of the Imperium's main battle tank will enter the arena, but only one of them can emerge as the victor. I will be judging them on their weapons, war gear, abilities and points costs, as well as my own experience using them on the battlefield. And so, without further ado, let's mount up, roll out and dive right into today's episode. So the first thing that we are going to do is take a look at the shared base stat line of each Lehman Russ. You see, despite the fact that there are vanquishers and eradicators and all sorts of other variants, at the end of the day, they all come on the same hull. As a result, each Lehman Russ shares the same basic stat line. And it's important to know these characteristics because it will help us understand what the battlefield role of the Russ is. Each Russ has a movement value of 10 inches. This makes it relatively average in comparison to other vehicles in the guard multiple. For example, things like your Chimeras also have a 10 inch move. So it's speedy enough to keep up with the main advance. But in comparison to a lot of vehicles in Warhammer 40k, it is a little slow, especially when you compare it to something like Eldar Skimmers, which often will move 12 to 14 inches, if not more, with various abilities. Making up for its comparative slowness in the wider game, the Rus is an incredibly durable beast. It has got a toughness value of 11, meaning unless you are slinging last cannons at this thing, you are probably going to be wounding it on fives. It then has a 2 plus save, so even if you are hitting it with anti-tank weapons, it's probably, if it's benefiting from cover, still going to be on a 4 plus save. At worst, you might reduce this thing down to a 5 up save, and it's not even got an invulnerable to do that. It's just so well heavily armoured. Just a small side note here, but out of all of the games that I've played in 10th edition, I can't actually remember a time when my Russ hasn't got a save, even when it's been hit by something like Melter with AP-4 or AP-5. With a little bit of cover, this thing has always got a chance to just stop the damage dead. But even if your opponent does manage to sneak some damage past, the Russ's chonky 13 wounds almost guarantees that it's never going to be taken out by one shot alone. Your opponent is going to need to throw quite a lot of anti-tank firepower to finally bring down this battle tank. Rounding out the stat line, we do have a leadership value of 7+, plus, which is pretty standard in the guard, but it is important to note that that is a little susceptible to battle shock. Fortunately, it seems like morale isn't super impactful. And unlike, let's say, your infantry, who you definitely want to make sure are passing the morale so you can use things like reinforcements on them, the Lehman Rust doesn't really need a huge amount of stratagem support. You might be tempted to use Armored Might on them here and there, maybe a CP reroll, but they tend to get by absolutely fine just with their own abilities and the other force multipliers available in the guard. They're not overly reliant on stratagems. Finally, we have an objective control of three, which is very normal for a vehicle of this size. Nothing much to write home about. In addition to this shared stat line, all the Lehman Russes have access to the same supplementary firepower and war gear. For example, each Lehman Russ comes equipped with its main turret weapon, and that differs between the different variants, and that's what we'll be diving into later and working out which one is the best one. But on top of this, you also get a Lance Cannon, and you can swap that Lance Cannon out for a Heavy Bolt or Heavy Flamer. And on top of that, you can take two more weapons, either a pair of Heavy Bolters, Heavy Flamers, multi melters, or Plasma Cannons. And on top of this, you also can take a Heavy Stubber or a Storm Bolter, and on top of all of this, that we've already talked about, all these weapon systems, you can slap on a hunter killer missile. Looking at that stat line and at the weapons and war gear that you can slap on to the Rus, it becomes obvious that the point of this vehicle is to be a fire support unit. 
Its stat line makes it really durable, really tough. It's a bit of a bruiser. It can trundle forward, and even if the enemy gets the drop on it, it'll probably survive a barrage and be able to fire back. And when it does fire back, it's bringing a hell of a lot of DACA to bear. But it is not a close combat vehicle. The only close combat weapons it gets are its armored tracks, which are six attacks at weapon skill four plus. I mean, anything with a weapon skill four plus isn't really a combat unit. And then you've got strength seven, AP nothing, damage one. So when we're looking at this vehicle and we're comparing the different variants, what we want to be thinking about is how likely is this vehicle going to be taking punches to the face? And what kind of firepower can it throw back at the enemy? And does it have any way of being able to mitigate close combat situations? But that's enough about what these Russes have in common. Now let's take a look at what separates the tanks. Let's get into the different variants, starting off with what I believe to be the worst one and working our way up to what I, in my opinion, think is the best Russ in 10th edition right now. Coming in last place is unfortunately one of my favorite Leon Russes. It is... I would say mighty, but considering it's at the bottom of the pile, that's probably not the right word to use. It is the Vanquisher. Unfortunately, this vehicle, whilst extremely viable in 9th edition, has once again returned to its natural spot in the most hierarchy, coming in at the bottom. And this is simply because it has lost many of its abilities that made it actually good in 9th. The Vanquisher Battle Cannon is a heavy weapon that has a 72 inch range. It has a ballistic skill of 4 plus, so of course if you stay still it can get up to a 3 plus. And oh, if you order it, it can go up to a 2 plus. How interesting. It's strength 18, it's AP minus 4, and it is a mighty, that's a genuinely mighty damage D6 plus 6. So what's the problem with it? Well, it only fires one shot. And from a competitive point of view, Asking a unit to stand still is basically the same as it not doing anything. The problem with Lemus Vanquishers is on competitive boards, the terrain is so dense, there's so much ruins that you can't see across, that it's going to have to move around. It's going to have to get from point A to point B. It's got to be able to get angles. It's got to be able to get those far lanes. And so the heavy rule means very little to it. And if you tell it to take aim, that's fine, but it's only hitting on threes, which means it has a 33% chance of missing. If it fired multiple shots, this wouldn't be a problem, but because it only fires once, you have a third of a chance of just it not hitting. And considering there are only five turns in the game, even if this thing gets to fire from turn one, which is a big if, because if you go first and you're playing on a competitive board where everyone's able to hide the majority of their armies behind ruins from the get-go, you're probably not going to be able to even shoot this thing turn one. But even by some miracle, you are able to shoot turn one with this vehicle and it misses. That is 20% of its combat effectiveness just gone. 20% of the main reason to take it is just gone. Sure, you can say, oh, what about all the other weapons, the heavy boulders and the lads cannons and all the other accoutrement that it has? Yeah, okay, that's fine, but that doesn't separate it from the other Russes. That doesn't give it an advantage over the other Russes. And if I'm taking a battle tank, the main reason why I'm going to choose a particular variant is not the same common shared sponsors and hull weapons. That might make up for the function not being very good, but it's not really... The reason i'm looking at it and so for that reason it's just too swingy and it used to be able to ignore invulnerable saves now obviously ignoring vulnerable saves is a bit of a hot topic because ignoring invulnerable saves some people like it some people didn't i think it became a little too common by the end of ninth edition but i think with the vanquisher it actually made it viable but now even if you are to shoot this thing at an enemy vehicle there's so many four plus invulnerable saves knocking around these days that even if you get the hit, even if you get the wound, you might, you probably might just save it. It's only AP minus four. With a bit of cover or an invulnerable save, there's a really decent chance that your opponent just blocks the shot. And if that happens, then again, your combat effectiveness is down. There's just too many barriers. Let's say you hit three out of five turns. Okay, but then your opponent could pass two out of three of those saves on a four plus invulnerable save. Could go either way, it could be one, it could be two. 
but suddenly you're just, you're just doing no damage. If you're lucky, you might pop an enemy vehicle, but with D6 plus 6 damage, maybe you will, maybe you won't, but then you've got Feel No Pains that are coming in. Look, end of the day, it's obvious to me there's just too many barriers in the way to make the Lehman Russ Vanquisher Battle Cannon viable. Now, its ability that it also has is the tank killer ability. Each time this model makes a range attack with its Vanquisher Battle Cannon that targets a monster or vehicle unit, you can reroll the wound roll. I'm actually kind of okay with this ability because you can get reroll ones from Sentinels. So you don't really need a reroll to hit ability. Reroll into wound is quite nice. It means that once you do get your hit, you are almost guaranteed to wound against your intended target. But what if you're not shooting against a vehicle or monster? I think overall, it's just too specialized, the ability, and you're trying to support a weapon which fundamentally just isn't very good. So for me, sadly, the Lemurus Vanquisher is a big no-no. And I know there's going to be a lot of people... I, I, I've done many a Vanquisher video in my time, boys, over many editions, and every single time I talk about this tank, loads of people are going to come out of the world work, they're going to type down in the comment section, oh, my Vanquisher always achieves something, it always does well. It's like... Yes, I know that there are cases when the Vanquisher has done something in that one game and it's made it awesome, but anecdotal evidence, unfortunately, doesn't make this a good vehicle. And I know there's going to be a lot of people saying, Morning God, you're calling me out, man, you're calling me out. I'm not. Honestly, I've used the Vanquisher loads across many editions. The only time it was viable was in either 5th edition or in, in 9th edition, but it's not viable in 10th edition, unfortunately. Even if it is my favorite looking variant, and even if I want to be biased and put it at the top just for rule of call, I can't, sorry, it's a big no. But moving on, taking a step up the ladder, we have another badass Russ, but sadly, like with the Vanksha, rule of call in this case does not translate onto tabletop effectiveness. And we have the Lehman Russ Punisher coming in second to bottom place. Tiny tangent here, guys, but when I was getting back into 40k properly in 5th edition, one of the first models that I bought and built was the Lehman Russ Punisher. So it has a special place in my heart, and I've always wanted it to be an effective weapon, but it rarely has found its life again after that 5th edition codex, where it actually was pretty decent. The thing about the Lehman Russ Punisher is... It puts out a lot of DACA. If you want DACA, the Lemurus Punisher's answer is simply yes. The Punisher Gatling Cannon has a 24 inch range, 20 shots of Ballistic Skill 4 plus, Strength 6, AP 0, Damage 1. Now, the Punisher Gatling Cannon itself doesn't have any abilities, but when you go over to the Russ's unique ability on its data sheet, it has mow down the enemy. Each time this model makes an attack with its Punisher Gatling Cannon that targets an enemy unit, excluding monsters and vehicles, that attack has a Devastating Wounds ability. The problem with all of this is the Punisher Gatling Cannon is only Strength 6 AP 0. Now, Strength 6 is nice. It means you're going to be able to cut down lots of light infantry. But the Guard never has had a problem with killing hordes of guys. Orcs, Tyranids, it doesn't matter. We can just blow through them, no problem. The problem that Guard tends to have is cracking those tougher, more elite armies where you can throw enough dice at them, but sometimes your opponent just keeps making those two up, those three up saves. And the Punisher Gatling Cannon doesn't help us solve that. And what's a bit frustrating about this whole thing is even if, you know, it could do devastating wounds and that would actually help it against vehicles and monsters, and you'd be like, ah, well, there we go. We can actually start grinding away the big things as well. When you actually look at mow down the enemy, it excludes monsters and vehicles. So this thing is a weapon that is designed to solve a problem that the guard doesn't struggle with. And the one ability that it could have had, Devastating Wounds, to help it start crossing boundaries and start being able to help with multiple different targets and getting it out of being overly specialized, is then limited so that it can't actually do Devastating Wounds against the things you're probably going to want to do Devastating Wounds against. And unfortunately, even with those like 20 Punisher shots, if you are putting this thing into like elite infantry, like Terminators or Custodes, it doesn't generate 
enough devastating wounds. That's the ironic thing about this whole thing. Because even if all 20 shots hit, and even if all 20 shots wounded, on average, you're doing three devastating wounds. It's really not that much to write home about. You go and look at anything in the Eldar Index, and I know comparing to the Eldar Index is a folly. It's a fool's errand because everything in that book is overtuned. But just using it as an example of the fact that it has access to quite a lot of devastating wounds, a unit that costs 280 points, I believe, is the, in the case of the Lehman Rust Punisher. Yes, 280 points. Only doing three mortal wounds? It's just laughable. So, unfortunately, the Punisher, like I said, it solves a problem that doesn't exist and it doesn't have any way of getting out of being overly specialized. I've put it as slightly higher than the Vanquisher because... If you do come across an army like Tyranids or Orcs who, or any kind of Horde army, being able to like mow them down and having a Punisher might, you know, save your ass. But in a world with blast weapons and all sorts of other stuff, being an anti-infantry vehicle isn't all that much to really put on your CV. So it's slightly better than the Vanquisher, but not really by much. So before we move on to our next Russ, I just want to make something clear. From this point on in the video, all of the Russes that we're looking at are viable. The Punisher and the Vanquisher will actively handicap your list. They will make it worse. But everything going forward will at the very least be viable. It won't weigh you down. There will be better options, but this thing can actually do stuff. Or, as we get further the list, they go from being more than just viable, they go to downright good. And keeping that in the back of your mind, the next Rust that I'm going to talk about, the one which I think is fifth overall, is potentially a little controversial. I know a lot of people are going to be typing down the comment section saying, Mordian, you're wrong about this. But bear in mind, I said it's still viable. It's not a bad vehicle, okay? But this is one that I definitely think is going to cause a bit of a stir. I'm going to say the fifth best Lehman Russ is the Executioner, the one with the big plasma turret. The reason why it might cause a bit of a stir, me putting this quite low down, is because this vehicle used to be the best Russ variant back in 9th edition. But how the mighty have fallen. The meta has changed. We're not in 9th anymore. We're in 10th and this is a different game. So let's lift up the rock and have a look at some of the insects, the bugs that are underneath. The Executioner Plasma Cannon, for starters, has two firing modes, Standard and Supercharge. The Standard mode is Blast, 36 inch range, D6 plus 3 shots, Ballistic Skill 4 plus, Strength 7, AP minus 2, 2 damage. And when you supercharge the thing, it gains the Hazardous special rule and also an extra strength, an extra AP, and an extra damage. Now, on the surface, I will admit that that weapon looks pretty tasty, and it's very good at destroying elite infantry. But the issue is that it also struggles against the new vehicles. Toughness has gone up, and as a result, at best, your Executioner is going to be wounding enemy vehicles on fours. And that's at the very best. That's against the lightest vehicles and you are supercharging against them. If you start encountering anything from a Chimera and up, and we all know that Chimera and their equivalents are not exactly heavy armor. They're light armor, they're medium armor at best. So anything that's medium armor and above, you're wounding it on fives. And in an addition, which is increasingly becoming more mechanized, more and more people are including armor and dedicated transports in their army. Having a unit which can only tackle that stuff on fives really is quite limited. Also, it's important to note that the quintessential and very popular tournament elite infantry army is the Adeptus Custodes. Now, primarily they're a melee focused force and what they like to do is move on to objectives with big blocks, custodian guard and just lock them down. And if they do that, they often sort of just win by just dominating on primary points. There's other tactics, of course, but we're talking in generalizations. Now, with good screening, your executioners shouldn't have to worry about melee from those custodies but not every plan survives contact with the enemy 
and you might find yourself having to move your executioner a little bit further forward. Maybe you have to get point blank because it is sat in the middle of terrain that you just can't see and you need to get up close and personal and start blasting them to try and shift them from that objective. But maybe you fail. They are very tough after all. It's so a 4% vulnerable save. It can go either way, right? If that happens and the custodians then just get into combat with your executioner, they don't need to kill it to make it combat ineffective. They can just tie it up and because it's armed with blast weapons, which are both a blessing and in this case a curse, you wouldn't be able to fire and without even killing your vehicle, they're taking it out of action. On top of this, I'm not a huge fan of the gung-ho executioner's ability. Each time this model makes an attack with its executioner plasma cannon that targets a unit that is below half strength, add one to the hit roll. It might seem like getting your executioner up to hitting on twos is really, really good, but I don't think it pans out in reality. Firstly, what if you get the drop on someone? What if you get that first strike? Well, in this case, it doesn't do anything. So you've got an ability that's just not impacting the game. Oh, brilliant. And then you get to the other end of the situation where it's like, well, this is 40k. Either units tend to be at full strength or units tend to be dead. They don't tend to be halfway through. People tend to focus fire and get rid of them. But even if you do manage to target units below half strength, do you know what turns that tends to happen? Like turns three, turns four, turns five. The later turns of the game. And frankly, because of the I go, you go system of 40k, often, not always, but often, Games are decided in the first three turns. If you've got something that's not kicking in potentially until turn four, turn five, before it's really becoming consistently effective, not really worth it. Probably by that point, it might be too late. So it's an okay ability. And just summing all of this up, I'm not completely shitting on the executioner. I've said it's got a good weapon. I've said that getting plus one there is still totally viable. But I just think that it's a decent tank, but it is in no way the best tank that you can get anymore. Now this next Levan Russ, oh mummy, I know that putting this one above the Executioner is gonna get me a lot of shit, but I'm gonna stick by my guns. I'm gonna explain my position, but I think coming in fourth is the Lehman Russ Eradicator. I know the Nova Cannon one, the one that has been terrible since it was first introduced. It's never been good. It's never had a time in the spotlight. I'm actually putting this thing above the Executioner. I know. I thought the last one was spicy. Oh, baby. Well, let me explain myself. Before you lambast me, let me tell you why I think this tank is now viable. Firstly, it's points cost. It is actually one of the cheapest Lehman Russes. Some of the ones we've looked at so far, considering how terrible they are, you'd be surprised how expensive they've come in. Lehman Russ Vanquisher, worst tank here, 190 points. Lehman Russ Punisher, a little bit cheaper, 180 points. Lehman Russ Executioner, an eye-watering 195 points. It's viable, but that makes it pretty pricey. The Lima Russ Eradicator, considering how far it is up this list, is only 180 points, which makes it about the price a Russ should be. I know a lot of people consider Russes to be overcosted, but I think a Lima Russ Eradicator is actually decently pointed. But let's take a look at the main weapon, the Eradicator Nova Cannon. It's blast and it ignores cover. It's got a 36 inch range, and D3 plus six shots. Now this is important to note. Pretty much all the other rust cannons are, which are blast and random shot, are three plus D6. But this has a flat six shots and then you add D3 on top of it, giving it an incredibly high average shots, coming in at a solid eight. And even if you roll a big fat one, you're still getting seven shots. So it always puts in the work. It's then strength seven, AP minus one, two damage. Now I know what you're thinking. That doesn't sound like a very impressive profile, but bear with me. What I like about the Eradicator is that the strength seven isn't so much of a deal. It's not the worst thing in the world. It's not great. It suffers similarly to the Executioner where, you know, it's good at killing infantry, but it's not gonna have much play against vehicles. But with both of these tanks, that's why they're both viable. If they're able to stay still, if they're able to get a firing lane in, 
Then Born Soul just kicks in and you're able to auto wound on sixes to hit. And this definitely helps mitigate some of the strength issues that both of these tanks have. But okay, even if that puts them on a level playing field, the Executioner still surely has better AP and better damage. Well, arguably not. Because the Executioner is AP minus two, but the Eradicator's AP minus one and ignores cover. So against targets in cover, they're actually equal. And they do the same amount of damage. So essentially, the Eradicator has the same profile as the unsupercharged Executioner Plasma Cannon. Now, sure, the Executioner can supercharge, but if you do so and you roll that one, pff, any of you watch my battle port with the Knights versus the tanks, my, one of my Executioners blew itself apart. It rattled itself apart just because of Hazardous. All that plasma on the Sponsons, on the turret, really causes your tank to degrade very, very quickly. Now, sure, the Eradicator doesn't have that option, but what's interesting is, with a little bit of help from its friends, it can easily match the relevant AP, and that is important when I say it, use the word relevant, relevant AP of the Executioner. Because you've got things like Fields of Fire, the stratagem that Guard of Axe do, which once you shoot an enemy unit once with, say, a basic infantry squad or something else in your army, you shoot that enemy unit once, you spend a couple of CP or you have Creed nearby, so you don't spend any CP on this and it's free and you can do it on two units. I'm waffling here. Basically, you can put an extra AP on enemy unit. Well, suddenly, now your, your Eradicator Nova Cannon is AP minus two ignores cover. Now, AP minus two, in a lot of cases, against infantry, especially elite infantry, is all you need. Because if you're shooting at something like light infantry in cover, well, they're typically going to have like a four plus at best, probably a five plus save. Well, AP2, boom, that either takes the save completely away from them or they're on a six up because you're ignoring cover. If you come across some very elite infantry, something like Terminators or Custodies, well, guess what? You are going to hit a four plus invulnerable save well before AP3 and AP4 and anything like that matters. So the there's no point in adding extra AP in many cases, no point in adding extra AP onto the Plasma Executioner because AP3 is just going to, AP4 is just going to bump into that invulnerable save soon, sooner rather than later. But with the Eradicator, you can essentially get the benefits of the supercharge of the AP and not have the risk of overheating and killing yourself. Sure, you are going to miss out on the damage three. I will give that a point in the favor of the Executioner. But everything else goes towards the Eradicator. It's got more liable number of shots. It can easily match the Executioner's anti-infantry capabilities. And it can also more than take care of elite infantry with a tiny bit of support. But at this point, I would argue that the Executioner and the Eradicator are kind of, at best, equals equals. And I know there's still be a lot of people that remain unconvinced that the Executioner is better. But I think what separates the two and what gives the Eradicator a really important leg up is its ability. Urban Warfare. When making ranged attacks with its Eradicator Nova Cannon, this model can target enemy units within engagement range of it in addition, when making ranged attacks, this model does not suffer the penalty to hit rolls for being within engagement range of one or more enemy units. This ability solves a lot of problems for the vehicle and for the guard in general. Specifically for the vehicle, it means you can use this very aggressively. You can have it on the front lines, you can have it pushing forward, and you genuinely don't care if the enemy tags it in combat because it has no impact on the vehicle. Any of its weapons that it's shooting in engagement range don't suffer the penalty of minus one to hit. And it can still shoot the Nova Cannon as well, even though it's a blast weapon. So this thing can push forward it can take that risk of going on to the custodians into the middle it can just absolutely blast them and if they try and tie it up you're like well that's fine i guess i'll just shoot you with no issues and remember you can use things like lord solar and uh, master vox 24 inch range orders give this thing take game no matter where it is it's always going to be hitting on a three plus just firing away so it's good because it can't be locked down. One of the big, big problems of guard tanks since 8th edition has been 
you tag them up, they can't do anything. Well, that's gone. That's solved. So veteran guard players, they'll know how important that is. They'll know why I'm putting so much weight on that because we've gone through six, seven years of tanks just being locked up in combat. It's so frustrating, right? But then it also solves a wider problem for the guard, which is guard can often take ground, but guard struggle to hold ground. You can move wave after wave of infantry onto an objective, but they're probably just going to keep getting blown backwards unless you're spamming things like Death Corps Krieg with Death Corps Marshals, but then you're susceptible to blasts, so, uh, you know, swings and roundabouts. Suddenly you can take an eradicator. You can have that drive onto the objective with your Kriegers. If your opponent tries to, like, wrap all that stuff up between the two quite durable units, Russ is... is pretty tanky you should be able to hold on to the objective and it's bringing 3 oc to the table as well which is not insignificant that is the equivalent of three terminators banging on the hole trying to you know capture the objective so not only does it allow you to not worry so much about this vehicle but it also allows you to take and hold ground which is something the guard have struggled with for a very long time but like I said, I appreciate that it's pretty controversial to put the Eradicator above the Executioner. So in all seriousness, let me know what you think down in the comment section below. Do you think that for all of its fancy power tricks, the Eradicator still doesn't have the punch to get the job done? Or are you starting to maybe look at this tank in a new light and consider what it can do for you let us know down that comment section but now we get into the top three these are the big boys the ones that will always have a place in your list and are genuinely good units coming in with the bronze medal we have the good old-fashioned the el classico the lehman russ battle tank I have to say, I kind of feel like a proud dad seeing this venerable old beast still pulling its weight, still being a fantastic unit in the guard. I have had some of my own Lemus Battle Tanks in my army for 20 years. The very first Lemus that I bought and built myself, one that I didn't get secondhand, was a Battle Tank variant. So seeing this in the top three really does bring a happy tear to my eye, a little smile on my face. Now, the Lemus Battle Tank, I would describe, as always, as the jack of all trades, the master of none. You can put this in your army and it will always be viable. It'll always be effective against almost any target that you shoot at. But... It'll never be the best choice against that unit. It'll never be, this is a thing that can take down anything from Terminators all the way up to Super Heavies. It'll just be decent in all cases. But having that reliability, knowing that you're always able to just throw it into something, chuck it into a list, and no matter what you come across, it'll be good, is unbelievably valuable, especially from a competitive point of view. Because you can't list Taylor. You don't know what you're gonna face off against. I mean, all right, right now at the time of recording at 10th edition, you know you might be guaranteed to face Eldar at least once, but there's no point in trying to plan how to beat them right now. They're just a bit, a bit spicy, to say the least. Anyway, the point is that if you've got a unit that you don't know what you're gonna face off against, but you always know this thing is gonna not let you down, it's always gonna have good play into any army that's really really viable in a competitive setting when you can't pick your matchups but let's get under the skin of this vehicle let's start looking at its actual weapons and the main one the biggie is the battle cannon now this is a blast weapon 48 inch range actually one of the longer range weapons we've looked at today a lot of them have been either 24 or 36 so 48 decent more than enough to cover almost any spot on a 10th edition board the smaller boards it's also d6 plus three shots giving it decent reliability the same as many others ballistic skill four plus okay so so far so normal right 
Then we get to the strength 10. Yes! Proper strength! For the first time, something that is not just able to scratch the armor of light vehicles, something that can actually slingshot into light and medium vehicles and still wound them on threes. Even heavier armor, you're going to be wounding on fours. This gives the Lima Rus great play into both infantry, because we're wounding almost any infantry on twos, because that's strength 10. Even Terminators with T5, you're getting wounded on twos. And then also all the way up to actually being viable against a lot of motor pools and a lot of different armored and monstrous targets. The main letdown of the Rus, of the battle cannon, is the AP. It's only minus one. But as we saw with the Eradicator, that's not so much of a problem because you have access to abilities like Fields of Fire, which will allow you to get that AP up. And as you'll see later on with some of the other Russes that we'll be looking at today, there are more than one way of being able to up that AP. And then you can also ignore cover with things like Hellhounds. So suddenly again, you're indirectly boosting the AP, you're pseudo boosting it. So AP minus one in a guard army really isn't the handicap that it feels like because you've got so many different tools of getting around that. And finally, you've got that flat damage three. God, I love flat damage three. One of the best things about the old executioner, the plasma we looked at before, is that it can get up to damage three. But unlike the executioner, which to do that has to risk blowing itself up, the bow cannon doesn't have the supercharge, doesn't have any crazy rules like that. It's just always AP three. Uh, sorry, always damage three, I should say. And let me just <laughs> let me just say. I have lost count of the number of games when I have fired my battle cannon at an enemy target and my opponents like failed a couple of saves and they're like, okay, yeah, so what's the damage on that? Like two damage? And I'm like, no, it's three. And they look up and they look you in the eye and they go, what? It's three damage? No way. And you have to like show them the data card because it's just such a big cock slap. It's just such a weighty amount of consistent damage and getting it on a long range platform that you can boost its AP on that you have such a great, just basic strength 10 is fantastic. So the only downside to the battle cannon is its AP. Everything else is a positive and the best bit is the AP is not even an issue. So it's a really, really solid weapon. In my opinion, so far, it is the most powerful weapon we've looked at out of all the different Russes. And it's just really, really good. And this only gets better with the Armored Spearhead special rule. Each time this model makes an attack that targets an enemy unit, reroll a hit roll of one. There's inbuilt reroll ones. That's just so good. Don't need any Sentinels, don't need any Daring Recon, don't need to wait for the Sentinels to get in range or anything like that. Nope, just I have reroll ones. Oh, and if that unit is within range of an objective marker that you do not control, you can reroll all the hit rolls. It's just bonkers. You're giving guard four rerolls to it and I don't have to do anything for it. Oh, I've targeted an enemy unit on objective. I wonder if this game is all about primary objectives and that people are going to be clustering around points on the middle of the map. I wonder if that's a thing. Oh, wait, it is a thing. Oh, honestly, Armour Spearhead is probably the second best ability we're going to look at today. It could even be equal first. It makes the Amos Battle Tank really, really hard hitting and a genuine proper damage dealer. It might cost 195 points, but I think the Lemus Battle Tank is worth every single penny. But then we move on to our silver medalist, our second place Russ. And I have to admit, I thought long and hard about this. I wasn't sure if I should focus on pure damage output if being a force multiplier would make a huge difference. But in the end, after much due consideration, I went for the Lehman Russ Demolisher. Now, the Demolisher is the most expensive variant. And I have to admit that probably is what swayed me on putting it onto second place. It's 220 points. Taking one Demolisher is more than 10% of your army list. 
it's a really big investment. And so for a big investment, you need a lot of tank. Fortunately, you're getting a hell of a lot of tank. The Demolisher Battle Cannon is Blast. It's only a 24 inch range, which means it's going to be on the front lines, boys. It's going to be in the heat. And then it fires D6 plus three shots. So it's got a reliable number of shots. It's ballistic skill four plus, but with take aim and other orders, you can get. That's, that's a 3+, plus really. And then you've got Strength 14. Boom, baby. Finally, a weapon that is going to wound all armor except for the absolute heaviest shit like the Stomper. All armor is getting wounded on a 3+. Plus. You're even going to be able to squash some light vehicles on, like, 2+, pluses, which is mad. But, yeah, you're wounding anything on the game 3+, plus or better. It's AP-3. So it doesn't need to ignore cover. It just destroys the cover and still pushes you on to your invulnerable save, Mr. Custodes. But the big ugh, fly in the ointment, it's a big turd floating around the bowl, has to be its damage. It's D6. Ugh. D6 damage. I, I hate D6 damage. I, if it was D6 plus one, if it was D3 plus 3, it wouldn't matter. But D6 damage for me, along with that points cost, is just... That's what puts it in second place, not first. I have played many a game. I have used Demolishers many times. And they've always been like this D6 damage, right? And it's always let me down. Anytime I use a D6 damage weapon... When I really, even if I just need a two, I always roll a one. Even if I just need a three, I always roll a one or a two. I never get the big five or the big six when it matters. When it doesn't matter, I get the good damage when I'm like smashing apart like a two wound infantry person. And when I'm getting the, when I really need just to get a little bit above minimum damage, I never do. It always flops. So maybe that's my personal bias coming in there. I will admit that. If you're really good at rolling D6 damages, then that's fine. But in my personal experience, when you've crossed all of the hurdles, when you've got the hits, you've got the wounds, the enemies fail their saves, it's so frustrating. It's such a negative game experience when you roll badly on the damage. It's really feel bad to you. So it's a very, very powerful weapon and it will do a huge amount of damage to your opponent, but it could also just make a small farting noise and not do anything. So that's why the Demolisher on paper is very good and in practice it's pretty decent, but often it does let you down a little bit. Now, some of you might be thinking, but Mordi in that 24 inch range combined with Blast, surely that makes this an awful unit. It needs to be way below down on the roster because if it gets tagged in combat, it's, it's screwed, right? Well, fortunately not because like the Eradicator, it has a special rule that lets it shoot in combat. This time it's called Line Breaker, but frankly guys, it does exactly the same thing. When making a ranged attack with its demolition battle cannon, this model can target enemy units with an engagement range of it. In addition, when making ranged attacks, this model does not suffer the penalty to hit rolls for being within engagement range of one or more enemy units. So it's exactly the same wording, it's just a different name. Not sure why GW decided to do that, but yeah. So if this unit, gets tied up in combat, it shoots away, no problem, even with its demolisher. And so, again, this is fantastic if you need to push forward, you need to take risks with your tanks, you need to be having them going up close and personal so that they can like dig enemy units out of cover that they're hiding inside. And also it means you can move the Rus on and hopefully help hold that objective. All of the positives that I already mentioned about the Eradicator rule apply here. It was amazing when we talked about it a few minutes ago and it's amazing here. But of course, there can only be one winner. One final rust that we've not talked about today. And I would definitely say a surprise. If you've looked at this unit's history over the course of many years, it's always struggled to find its place. It's always lived in the shadows of other vehicles. But now, finally, is its time. I am talking about the Lehman Russ Exterminator. 
But what makes the Exterminator the best tank in 10th edition? What has it done to deserve such a glow up? Well, let us begin by taking a look at its new and very, very improved Exterminator Auto Cannon. It's Rapid Fire 4 and it's twin linked. So when it gets within half range, it's going to double its amount of shots. And at all ranges, it's got inbuilt full rerolls to wound. Now, there are some arguments on the difference between four rerolls to hit and four rerolls to wound. But however you slice it, this vehicle, just in its standard abilities, we're not even talking about the unique ones that it gets in the rest of is getting something comparable to the Liam's Battle Tank. It's getting inbuilt Rerolls in this case, full rerolls to wound. It's got a range of 48 inches. So, rapid fire of a 24 inch range is fantastic for a lot of weapons. That's their max range. Look at the demolisher before its max range of 24 inches. Exterminate is firing four shots. You get it within 24 inch range, it's firing eight shots. Ballistic skill 4+, plus, but we know we can get that up to 3+, plus with take aim. We've said that a few times before. Strength 9. Now, strength 9 is good. It's not great, it's good. Strength 9 means that most light vehicles and infantry, even heavy infantry, you're wounding on 3s, and then light infantry, you're going to be wounding on 2s. But it just allows you to tickle medium armor. Because... You'll be wounding it on fours. Sure, heavy armor, you'll be wounding on fives. And normally, I would then compare this to the Eradicator, the Executioner, and be like, look, it's just not good at killing vehicles. But then we remember Twin Linked. Strength 9 with full rerolls is more than enough to deal with heavy armor. It's absolutely fine. It means that you could just sling this unit into anything, and it's always going to be doing damage. Twin linked in this particular instance is really, really nice. AP minus one, again, totally acceptable. We saw that with the Lemurus Battle Tank. We can get it up to higher AP if we need to. And damage three. The thing that I went on and on and on about with the Battle Cannon. It's got damage three. Flat damage three. Oh, it's so This thing is so much better than the Executioner. It's so good. So it's got the range. It's got the number of shots. It's got the strength thanks to Unlinked. We can easily boost its AP and it has damage. Three. It's got the damage. It's never going to do a demolisher on us and roll a big fat one. It's just going to be smashing enemy units. Enemy Terminators, one shot. Custodies, unless they've got one of those shields, one shot if they fail to save. It really does destroy vehicles and it destroys infantry but wait there's more because not only does the exterminator do really 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 good reliable damage but it also is one of the only russes that acts as a force multiplier and anyone who has watched my videos for any length of time will tell you i have a big old hard on for force multipliers because the guard is not an army where individual units just really sort of look after themselves and this unit on its own is going to smash the enemy that's not what it how they work it's not how we work okay the guard is all about Force multipliers. It's all about taking units, combining them with other abilities, other units of stratums, and individually, they're not all that impressive. But as force together, each one multiplies the original attack until you end up with a really, really powerful damage output. Really, really strong amount of damage that you could just blow your opponent away with. And the Lemus Exterminator does that with the Withering Hail ability. In your shooting phase, after this model has shot, select one enemy unit hit by one or more of those attacks made with its exterminate autocannon. Until the end of the phase, each time a friendly Astra Militarum unit, not squadron, not regiment, any unit in your army, makes an attack that targets that enemy unit, improve the AP characteristic of that attack by one. Same enemy unit can only be affected by its ability once per phase. So you can't take three exterminators and withering hail them three times and add three AP. It adds one extra AP, okay? 
This is so good. <laughs> because you can stack Withering Hail with the Fields of Fire stratagem to be able to put AP minus two. Whilst you can't stack exterminators, you can stack you can stack exterminators and stratagems. And this suddenly gives Guard a really, really unique position. It gives us something that a lot of other armies can't do. We can get around the AP reduction that has afflicted so many weapon systems in 10th edition. Everyone else is running around with AP1, AP dash weapons. Oh, if you're lucky, it's like AP2 or 3. The Guard can take any AP1 weapon and with one tank, which you're going to be taking anyway because it's really powerful, and one stratagem, which you could do for free, you can suddenly get AP minus two. Or you could take two exterminators and you could take Fields of Fire and you could take Creed to Fields of Fire again and you could liberally, across four enemy units, sprinkle extra AP. Or you could concentrate onto two enemy units and have two enemy problems, two things that you just need to get rid of Double, a, double AP on that, minus two AP on that. It's so good as a force multiplier. And this is what makes me just easily just put the exterminator into the top slot because it's got the guns and it's also supporting the rest of your army. And the cherry on top is it's not even the most expensive variant. It's actually one of the middling price points. It comes in at 200 points. That's similar to your executioner that's similar to your battle tank so there you have it my dear conscript all of the lehman rust variants ranked from the very worst to the very best but as always this is just like my opinion man let me know what you think down in the comment section below in fact how about you rank the Russes from best to worst down in the comment section and we can see if you agree with what I've said here today or if you rank the Russes in a slightly different order. Of course, if you've enjoyed today's video, make sure you smash that like button and also subscribe to never miss an episode. And I just want to say, if you found today's video particularly helpful or informative, then please consider becoming a channel member or Patreon supporter. By supporting the channel, you will not only be helping me create more content, but unlocking loads of perks for yourself, including access to the Mordian Glory Discord server. This is an online community with over 2,000 active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We have got channels for army lists, tactics, hobbying, painting, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. And I just want to take a moment to say a massive thank you to all of the current channel members and Patreons. You guys are amazing. You truly are the lifeblood of this channel, and I could not do Mordian Glory full-time without your generous support. And last, but certainly not least, I want to say a personal, special, heartfelt thank you to all of my top-tier supporters. These are the War Masters, the people that have truly gone above and beyond the Call of Duty. So a massive thank you to Bon Bon Vert, Ken Starr, Mark Panconi, Swordfish Trombone, John Stubbs, Nicholas Walsh, Diesel Fox, and August Barney. Thank you guys. Your ongoing and incredibly generous support makes a huge, huge difference. And I am eternally grateful to each and every single one of you. I hope you all enjoyed today's video. Thank you for watching. And of course, as always, I'll see you guys next time.